Hi, I'm not a chemist and today we're destroying perfectly good petroleum-based hydrocarbons to produce a non-reactive non-polar solvent consisting of squiggly lines and regular polygons. Right, so idealized combustion is explained by taking these nice looking squiggly hydrocarbon chains, adding to them the right amount of oxygen, heating them up a bit and poof! Perfect conversion to water, carbon dioxide and photons of the visible and infrared spectra flying all over the place at relativistic speeds. So called clean burning. And then you learn that as with everything in life, there are more exceptions than rules and hydrocarbons are not limited to these nicely behaving squiggly lines and circles. Well, screw that, I'm taking this here gasoline and attempting to get rid of most of the delinquents of the hydrocarbon world and we'll see if we can reach textbooks levels of squiggles. I started by setting up a fractional distillation outside uh, and then I poured around about a little bit less than a liter of gasoline to distill over. We want to get different fractions at different temperatures, collect them separately. That will be our first goal in this endeavor to, to get a solvent. Uh, gasoline actually consists of a lot of different components, a lot of different hydrocarbon lengths and shapes, and uh, uh, they have uh, quite different uh, boiling points. So some of them will evaporate at actually below zero degrees, like uh, butane and isobutane. As we start the distillation, you can actually see the butane and isobutane escape from this here uh, little vent. It, it's kind of hard to see. I had to manipulate the background a little bit uh, so that it's it's observable on camera. But yeah, there's, there was a lot of gas actually leaking out there. And this is the same butane gas that you would find in, in like petroleum gas and things like that. And uh, what, what's interesting and kind of nice about uh, the gasoline constituents is that their boiling point correlates to the amount of carbon they have in their molecules like for example all the all the five carbon molecules will kind of uh evaporate one after the other what i might what i what i mean by this is like if we look at uh, all the pentanes pentenes and things like that like isopentane evaporates at 28 degrees uh pentene evaporates at 30 and then pentane at 36 so all the five carbon chain things i mean you also get like cyclopentane in there somewhere which is i think 50 degrees evaporates at. So all of them kind of consecutively evaporate and only at 60 degrees do you get like the first hexanes, like isohexanes, things like that. Uh, so we can kind of separate the fractions based on the amount of carbon in the in the constituents uh, molecules just super useful the first fraction we're gonna get we're going to stop at uh, 50 degrees uh, around about where you get uh, cyclopentane so that's where we're going to stop first uh, what what is a little bit interesting about this is where i live there is um, you know a non not small amount of um, e ethanol added to gasoline to improve its octane number there uh, is an azeotrope being created between um, uh, ethanol and I think the hexanes and that uh, that also has a boiling point of well starting from like 45 or 50 degrees I believe so we will be getting that as well uh, mostly in the hexanes fraction but probably we got some here as well and this is what we got like it's it's not a it's it's not a small amount actually of pentane the thing is like since it evaporates at like less than 30 degrees it starts uh, evaporating we will lose a lot of it like it will just ambiently just evaporate which is uh, not very useful for a solvent that you want to keep around but we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll make use of it somehow later what's important is at least we see that this is fresh gasoline so that it still has all the light fractions in it uh, the next fraction uh, we'll st uh, start collected at around 60 degrees uh, up until 86 degrees and these are mostly the hexanes uh, what we get is of course the isohexane which evaporates at 60 degrees then you have the, the hexanes um, which evaporate at 69 and uh, we will stop at 86 degrees which means that a cyclohexane will catch a lot of it which uh, evaporates at 81 degrees and we will have also in our fraction here everyone's favorite resonant cancerogenic ring of benzene uh, it is in very small quantities but it will be in this fraction and uh, it's, it's important to know that this is obviously still all very toxic stuff but benzene is kind of like the big bad of 
of these fractions right now. We should have also gotten most if not all of the ethanol that exists in gasoline since not only does it evaporate it by itself at 78 degrees but also all the azeotropes it creates are around about in that range or lower. So we should be rid we should have collected all the ethanol as well. That's why actually the, 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 the fraction looks so big because uh, there's a lot of ethanol in gasoline or you know a, a fair amount. So the fraction here looks the largest of them all. Uh, just to quickly mention the next fractions that we'll collect. The next one is heptane. So basically all uh, molecules that have seven uh, carbons in them. Uh, we'll collect the fraction between 90 degrees and 108 degrees uh, which should give us the isoheptanes, heptanes, uh, actually also the iso octane so we'll have these three things happening here uh, there's still a, a good solvent for stuff and uh, we could use we could use them also later when we uh, creating our solvent but i kind of just set them aside for now uh, the next uh, major constituent of gasoline is uh, toluene and octane well octane there's not that much octane in gasoline but there is a lot of toluene and it evaporates at 110 degrees so we, we collect the next fraction in the range between 108 and 124 and we should stop uh, just short of like the, the octane fraction. Uh, so this theoretically should be all toluene mostly. Toluene is basically just a, a benzene ring which is single substituted. Uh, there is one methane plopped onto one of the positions where hydrogen should go on the on a benzene ring and then you have the next fractions uh, which i just collected uh, in one place starting from 125 degrees up to like 180 degrees there was still stuff evaporating 180 degrees so there's a bunch of also heavier stuff in this gasoline oh i don't know if there's a bunch of it. there's a little bit of heavier molecules in there and what we get here is basically the octane, ethyl benzenes, uh, xylene, uh, which are all kind of substituted benzene things happening there. And then the straight nine carbon chain, uh, which is which has the name of no name, uh, which evaporates at 151. And I mean, uh, there's some heavier stuff, I assume, like we, we stopped at 180 degrees, but there wasn't really that much stuff evaporating between those temperatures. And with this, we have all the fractions. Uh, so we have separated um, the, the gasoline into fractions which are a little bit more practi practically uh, usable in the sense that they have smaller temperature ranges so if you need uh, to use it as a solvent that you can uh, evaporate or, or condense over stuff it is a more practical range to work with this stuff. Uh, we have the, the, the light fractions of pentanes, the hexanes which are probably the most useful uh, but uh, with a bunch of ethanol in them which I did use basically like this in uh, my video where I extracted capsaicin making use of the fact that there's hexanes and ethanol mixed together in here the heavier the heavier fractions I did not do much with uh, since I was interested in getting an as inert as possible a solvent non-polar solvent which I decided to just make use of the of the lighter fractions between like 25 and 86 degrees uh, I just wanted to use the pentanes because I, I knew that like they would evaporate quite fast so it, it made sense to to make the best out of them uh, while they were still around so the first thing that I wanted to do was to get rid of as much of the ethanol as possible. We, we, we could also skip this step because the next step would take care of the ethanol but it would require more effort and time and material. Since ethanol uh, mixes with, with the, the uh, gasoline, we, we want to, to remove it somehow and ethanol like I talked in my ethanol uh, video it, it kind of likes mixing both with um, uh, non-polar and polar uh, uh, solvents and compounds but it kind of prefers mixing with with water more than with gasoline so with uh, the polar molecules of water it likes more than the non-polar molecules of, of gasoline so by just adding water and uh, mixing and washing the, the fraction a little bit with, uh, with water we should be able to pull the ethanol out which uh, kind of worked uh, here but like yeah, I don't think it pulled all the ethanol out at, at any rate uh, I think there was a fair amount of it left in there but it did probably help us a little bit so this is a you know valid non-polar solvent 
but what we are going to attempt to do here is to make it uh, also as inert as possible by basically oxidizing anything in it that can be oxidized and we're going to use the herbalest of all the herbal oxidants the potassium permanganate which also amazing name i love the word permanganate i don't know why but it's 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 a fun word it's, it's a very strong oxidizing agent. Uh, so I, I added initially just a tiny amount to see what happens. Uh, it's interesting, uh, in a few seconds, you can see the, the brown crust appearing on the glass, which is actually manganese oxide. So it is definitely oxidizing stuff. Uh, the reaction is definitely happening there. And I started adding more and more. I also added like a, a condenser on top uh, so that it refluxes. But what, what we are doing here, what we really want is to to keep all the hydrocarbons that have uh, f that are fully saturated, uh, like straight chain alkanes, you know, also like branched chain things that are just fully saturated, full of hydrogen and nothing else in there. No, no alcohols, no aldehydes, ketones, things like that, acids. Also, uh, unsaturated uh, hydrocarbons like alkenes and alkynes. And both of these things, they will kind of go towards uh, being carboxylic acids uh, slowly but surely, but they will go through being... Um, aldehydes and ketones in the middle which we will get rid of later in in, in a different way and uh, last but not least uh, we can get rid of uh, toluene this way because it uh, it will oxidize also to to benzoic acid uh, but we what we won't be able to get rid of this way is uh, ben the benzene it just won't get oxidized by potassium permanganate not that it's critical, there's not that much benzene in, in gasoline, so it doesn't really affect that much. And you can see with time, like this, this darker and darker crust starts forming and, and it becomes kind of hard to see what's happening. Uh, and we kind of want to, because we are adding the, the potassium permanganate little by little. And uh, what we want to see is all of it to uh, react away, to turn into uh, the manganese oxide uh, there and uh, for the purple color to go away. And once we know that there's no purple color, we add more potassium permanganate until the color persists. But we can't see the purple color because it all looks black. So uh, one trick to do is basically just take a pipette and pull a little bit from uh, this uh, dirty layer, which is not what we want in the end anyway, uh, and see if there's any purple in it. You can see it in the pipette uh, sometimes, but to be absolutely sure, you can just uh, uh, dissolve a little uh, a drop of this uh, solution into into a, a fair amount of water and since potassium permanganate stains in very low concentrations you should be able to see purple color if there is any uh, like you see here and at this point if that has persisted over a, a, a fair amount of time then uh, there's no more reaction happening presumably uh, so the oxidation has has f uh, finished and we now remain with our much more inert uh, solvent. As, as you can see, the the dark aqueous uh, layer it's it, it's immiscible with our solvent, so we can easily get rid of it in a, in a separate orifano. So uh, the, that's the next thing we do. So we have this this now. We we can clean it with uh, with water. We can also neutralize any carboxylic acids that have been created by the oxidation uh, with, with a little bit of uh, soda bicarbonate or anything like that. And after we're done, we're left with this admittedly yellow liquid. And it's, it's, it's interesting that it's yellow because I would have expected this to happen in the next step, but it happened before that. And I think what's happening here is that we are getting like these condensation reactions of uh, aldehydes and ketones that have been created in the oxidation step. Uh, they, they condense into like, what is it called, like aldo reaction. They just make bigger molecules by connect, by condensing, by connecting to each other with carbon to carbon uh, bonds, which is usually done in, in specific conditions, either in very acidic conditions or in, in basic conditions with, with, a, with a base in there, uh, which, would, which is our next step. We add into this liquid sodium hydroxide pearls and that should help the condensation reaction 
uh, kick in and then you get more and more like redder and redder bigger molecules that we can just uh, leave there because they're heavy so next we can distill uh, our product out without worrying about these heavier uh, molecules going along for the ride which is all nice and dandy it's just interesting that it started happening before that and i'm sure that's that that this is what's happened because as time passed and i um uh, set up this reflux uh over over the uh, the sodium hydroxide you can see that this yellow color it started concentrating to the bottom and started turning redder and redder in fact the next day i left well the next, i mean yeah I, I left it to reflux for a bit and then i left it overnight uh, just to sit there you can see that it basically became red and i think that's what that was and we didn't see like after distilling it it was gone so that's good and that yeah that's the the last step like at this point we can also do like a fractional distillation of a, a couple of different fractions that we want to use for different things but i just decided to put everything together in the same uh, fraction which actually ended up starting at around 40 degrees so the first very light fractions were already gone and so it distilled from like 40 something to, to around about 80 degrees actually uh, what's interesting is around 80 degrees I started getting some uh, murky stuff on the other side which I think is water so it was distilled like the water was uh, distilling over at 80 degrees which is a little bit low I guess it was some weird azeotrope thing happening but um, at the, so I decided to stop at this temperature and in fact like what was left in the flask it didn't even smell of petrol anymore more so it's probably all water with with the with the uh, with the base in there and the enones or uh, whatever weird combinations of organics that uh, that are in there basically tar so there's tar in there a anyway uh, so here we have this uh, liquid it was clear and then it started getting murky at 80 degrees so this is our solvent which should be quite inert at this point uh, but it has water in it so you know no, I, I decided to uh, dry it using molecular sieves. I added some molecular sieves in there. Uh, you can even see like the, the bubbling that uh, was there initially, which presumably is air leaving the molecular sieves at there as, as it's being pushed out by presumably water molecules going inside of them. And with that in mind, yeah, so I left it to dry and you can see that it was uh, nice and clear the next day and I just transferred it into a bottle, um, you know, I think I didn't mention this the last time I was using these bottles but to make the cap a little bit uh, better fitting I add Teflon tape uh, so that uh, not, it's harder for stuff to just leave the bottle evaporate off or things like that in case you never thought about it you can use Teflon tape on bottles which makes perfect sense and uh, yeah you can see the end result is this quite clear uh, liquid not much of it a little bit more than 100 milliliters I think um, which which tracks and it should contain pure ish simple hydrocarbon uh, fully saturated chains uh, it should basically probably have pentane in there maybe cyclopentane uh, isohexane hexane cyclohexane things like that basically straight chain alkanes uh, branch chain alkanes and cyclo alkanes whatever they're called so these are the things that we should have in here and we can use this as a solvent basically um it's probably useful somewhere and one day we we'll probably might use it but the main point here is that we 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 used gasoline to get to here which is quite nice uh, you can use this for extractions and I might end up using this uh, for an extraction later down the, the down the road. I have an idea of how to make a certain extraction happen in a single step instead of multiple steps and I and I'll need this for that. All right, uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.